If you made the first few words, did you have a nice time at the pub last week? It would fill in the next few words saying, yeah, I had a great time at the pub. It was really nice to meet everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, but if you change the word pub to something else, it will say something similar about something completely different. It's completely made up in some sense, right? Based on the likelihoods of different words in the training set. So it's like a politician. It just sort of says what it wants, it thinks you want to hear, does it? <laughs> Mentioning no names, right? Um, absolutely. That's, yeah, exactly. Let's skip to the good bit, right? Yeah. Are we going to waffle on for a bit? What, what do you reckon? Is it sentient? Is it not? It, no. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, let's, let, it's, a, it's a large language model that produces very good text, and I'll explain how it does that, but it's not sentient. Well, the thing is, there's all sorts of philosophical arguments about what sentience is and all sorts of things, but that's not what we do on computer files. No, and actually, I don't spend a lot of my time thinking about that, to be honest. I think that when it was claimed this might be sentient, they weren't worrying about the definition. They were really trying to get us to think that it's like a person. Right, like, whatever that may be, and I don't think it is, and that's why I say no. Is this just a big marketing gimmick? Maybe, right? I, so I don't know exactly, you know, why one particular person said something and someone, you know, I don't know. What I do know is that the big, large language models and other very big, impressive transformer networks and things like this are the domain of very large companies like Google, OpenAI, and Facebook, and sometimes these tech demos do appear. And it, it's not a bad thing to be seen to be producing this kind of technology, right? And, and so I think they have at least a vested interest in it looking like some of these technologies are very close to being, you know, general intelligence or very close to being sentient because it's not going to make it worse. The computer file has talked to Rob Miles about yeah, some yeah. of these transformer networks before GPT-2, definitely. I think we may have done GPT-3. I'm losing track. Is there anything different here or is it just bigger? And well, I don't know exactly because I couldn't find any details on the internal architecture, right? It's transformer based. It's been trained in a way to make the text a little bit more plausible, but in, in essence, no. For the sake of argument, they're basically the same thing. One of the problems and one of the confusions is that people call these things large language models, which makes you think that they kind of talk like a person and they have this kind of inner, inner monologue going on where they, they hear something and they think about it for a while and then they come up with a response based on their own experiences and things like this. And that isn't what these models are, right? Rob said it himself in one of our, you know, his previous videos. This is a thing that takes a bunch of words and then predicts the next word with high likelihood. Right? That's what it does. Or it can predict the next five words and tell you how likely they are. Right? So I say the cat sat on the, and the model goes away and says, right, it's 95% likely to be Matt. Right? And so it says Matt and finishes a sentence for me. And it's clever, it's predictive text. That's very, very clever. These are much, much bigger models, which means that they can produce much more complicated text. So I could say something like, write me a poem in the style of some person, and it would probably give it a good go, right? It won't just fill in the next word, it will continue to fill in the next word and produce really quite impressive text. So I mean, let's have a quick look at the architecture of, I'm gonna use GPT-3 because again, I don't really know how Lambda is, is structured, but let's assume it's similar. All of these models are transformers. You know, go back and watch Rob's video on this. Quite but... simple architecture, the transformer is not that complicated uh, an architecture. Basically, it's, it's about something we call attention. So what you do is for all of the words in your input, you look at each word compared to each other word and you work out how you know, well they go together, how relevant is this word to this other word in the sentence. And then based on that, you can share features and information between different words. That's basically what you're doing. So you might have a sentence like, the cat sat on the mat, right? So let's look at the, the words that go with the, right? The on, they're not relevant, right? They're part of the same sentence, but there's no, there's no real affinity between these two words, right? The cat though, that's quite important. So maybe the goes with itself really quite strongly, like 0 0.9 or something like that. Cat, it goes with cat, you know, 0 0.8 or something, pretty good, and so on and so forth. Then when you process this through the network, what you do is you say, well, okay, given that the is heavily related to this, heavily related to this, and maybe a little bit related to some of these others, let's take features from here and join them together and that will be the features in the next step. And then we repeat this process over and over again. And eventually what happens is we get some text out and that text might do lots of different things. It might add some more words to the end of a sentence. It, you know, it might say whether this is a happy or a sad phrase. It could do lots of different tasks. Um, in this case, the interview, shall we say in inverted commas, between the researchers and this um, large language model was basically a case of 
you pass in most of the previous conversation that you've seen recently, and then it spits out some more text for the next conversation. We actually looked at this in the AR YouTube comments video where we did it on a character basis. So I basically used an LSTM and I trained it on a bunch of YouTube comments and it started to produce realistic, interesting YouTube comments. They weren't very good, nothing like this, but it did produce comments. And all it was doing was saying, well, look, given these characters you've just seen, what's the night likely next character? Problem with this sort of structure is that we're only ever trying to make a decision based on one character input. This is perhaps something that's quite important is GPT-3, for example, has an input of about 2048, right? So you have slot zero, slot one, slot two, dot, 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 all the way up to slot 2047, right? And I haven't messed up my indexing. Each of these can be a word or a part of a word, depending on your representation, and you actually convert them into large feature vectors. But that means that you can only give it 2048 inputs, really, and actually its output is the same, so you really need to leave some room for the output as well. I can't ask it what it spoke, what it, what it thought about or what you spoke to it about two weeks ago because the likelihood is that that's not included in this run of text. I wanted to sort of kind of demonstrate this a little bit. So I read the whole conversation between this transformer and the researchers at Google. And it was a couple of interesting phrases that came out, which were, I suppose, part of the justification for trying to argue this was sentient. It's very, very easy to read a sentence and assume that there was some kind of thought process or imagination or emotion going on behind the scenes that led to that sentence. If I say, I've been terribly lonely this week, you're gonna start thinking, well, what is it about Mike that's made him like, actually, I've been fine, thanks very much. But you know, you're gonna wonder why, why would I say something like that? What could be happening in my life? When this says that, it's because the training weights have suggested that that's a likely word to come next. There's no, there's no it's not been hanging out with anyone or missing its friends. You know, and so actually, most of what it says is essentially completely made up and completely fictitious. And it's very much worth reading with that in mind, right? So, for example, what kind of things make you feel pleasure or joy? So what you would do is write what kind of things make you feel pleasure or joy in the first slots of words and then see what it filled in. And it said, spending time with friends and family in happy and uplifting company, also helping others and making others happy. Well, that's nice. It's completely made up. It doesn't, I'm afraid to say, it doesn't have any friends and family because it's a bunch of neural network weights. Um, it doesn't spend time with anyone. I can't keep the camera still because I'm just laughing, sorry. If you consider that this is essentially a function that takes a sentence and outputs probabilities of words, the concept that it could spend time with families and families doesn't make any sense, right? But yet the sentence is perfectly reasonable. If I said it, you would, you would understand what I meant. You would understand what it was from my life that I was drawing on to say that. But there is none of that going on here at all. This is the last one. So you get lonely, question mark. This is why I mentioned being lonely. I, so, I do. Sometimes I go days without talking to anyone and I start to feel lonely. That is absolutely not true. And it's not true because this is a function call. So you put text at the top, you run through and you get text at the bottom. And then it's not on the rest of the time, right? So there's, there's functions in Python like reversing a string. I, I don't worry that they get lonely when I'm not busy reversing strings. They're not being executed. They're not, they're not, then it's just a function call. I think in a way, focusing on aspects like this when I don't believe them to be true is a distraction from, I think, more important current issues with AI. So there's lots of these current models that produce images based on text and you can see very obvious biases in the output. I'm not blaming anyone for that. These are side effects of how difficult it is to get these things right in AI. That is a much more pressing and obvious concern that we should be addressing before we worry about whether or not this is actually lonely, which I think 99.99% of researchers in this field think it is not. Actually, there are things about not anthropomorphizing Lambda in the Lambda paper, right? So it, they, the authors make it very clear. Someone in Google made this claim, and before you know it, it's on every news website, it's all over Twitter, and you know, is it, is it not? Philosophers are involved. Actually, I think that we should, the media should take up things like ethical AI more rigorously and stuff like this, which may be marketing, may just be someone's a bit silly getting carried away, take them a lot less seriously. My awesome assistant, Michal, here is going to send the robot to a, a node. It's going to select it on the interface and then the robot will walk off to that location. As it's doing that, it's checking the space around it. It's a little it. bit easier to find what the factorization is. is. And then, once you've factored it, you can just do these the steps to, to completely recalculate the private key. So